Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. All the elders and angels bow. The redeemed we worship you now. Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. All the elders and angels bow, the redeemed. Worship you now, now, holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. We give God all the praise. Now, saints, as you're joining in, you can share this broadcast. Say, Lord, I received the prophet's reward. As you're joining in, you can share this broadcast and say, Lord, I received the prophet's reward. Saints, I'm going I'm to do a teaching on here right now. Uh, we in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 10 through 15. Verse 10 through 15, probably go to 16 and 17. But... Deuteronomy chapter uh, 6, verse 10. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 10. And 11 and 12, 13, 14, 15. Saints, all of you all, blessings to you. Thank you for sharing the broadcast. And thank you for getting the gospel out. I want you to share this broadcast as well as you're joining in. Genesis chapter 6. Verse 10 through 15. The Bible says, uh, it says, it shall be in verse 10 that when the Lord your God shall bring you into the land which he swore to Abraham, to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not meaning you didn't build them. This is all favor. This is all harvests. This is all the Lord bringing you into abundance. And then verse 11 says, and houses, and houses full of all good things, and houses full of all good things, which thou fillest not, which thou fillest not, and wells digged, which thou diggest not, vineyards and olive trees, which thou plantest not. Then it says, when thou shalt have eaten and are full. In verse 12, it says, then beware, lest you forget the Lord, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Then the Bible began to say in verse 13, Thou shalt fear the Lord your God, serve him. Then it also says, you shall swear by his name. I'm going to explain all these things, these things to you. Then verse 14 says, you shall not serve any other gods. You shall not serve any other gods of the gods of the people that are round about you. And in verse 15, we in Gen, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 15, it says, For the Lord your God is a jealous God. For the Lord your God is a jealous God. Lest his, uh, lest his anger, the anger of the Lord, be kindled against you and you be destroyed from off the face of the earth. So in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 15, 
it says the Lord your God is a jealous God among you. Lest the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and you be destroyed from the face of the earth. In verse 16, we're in Deuteronomy chapter uh, 6, verse 16. It then said, do not tempt the Lord. Do not tempt the Lord as you tempted him in Massa. And in verse 17 of Deuteronomy chapter 6, it says, uh, you shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God and keep his testimonies and his statures, which he has commanded thee this day. So saints, that's, that's, that's something that I want, I want to, I want to minister to you on these subjects because it's real powerful. And I've been studying this and meditating this. And if you study verse 10, how the Lord said that he's going to bring you into the lands which he swore to your fathers. So abundance, goodness, a lavish lifestyle, this is what God promised to the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they were all demonstrators of this. We know Isaac in Genesis 26. We know um, Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. <laughs> All of them are operating in the blessing and they're living big, prosperous. They have nice things. They have nice houses. These are all things that God has given to them. This is not what they have sought after. They have sought after God and God has promised them, I'm going to give this to you. So saints, when we deal with this type of lifestyle, it has nothing to do with people's opinion because people always have their own form of godliness. But you can't have a form of godliness without God because God has to form what the godliness should look like. This is what God has formed that the godliness, godliness looks like if you hearken diligently to his voice, like Deuteronomy chapter 28 was saying. Then Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 12, all these different chapters that's talking about him opening up his good treasure to you and pouring you out his good provisions, his blessings, his help, his assistance. And so in Deuteronomy chapter six, verse 10, is dealing with God bringing you into lands. That's property. That's property power. Now, this is God doing this. If people don't like it, it's because they don't agree with God. But the Lord, he is the creator of the universe. He is the one that calls you. Romans 8, 28. All things work together for the good of them that love God and are called according to his purpose. So you're not called according to the purpose of people's opinion. You called according to this God. And this is what this God is saying. Psalms chapter 68, I believe that's verse 19 and on, says that he daily loads you with benefits. So when we go to um, when we go to Deuteronomy chapter six, verse 10, look what it says right there. It says that when the Lord your God brings you into the lands, which he promised, he swore. Do you know what swore means? That means that he made a covenant that cannot be broken. When it said that he swore, that means that this is his whole image, his whole identity that's banking on this promise. He has put all of his validity in this. That's what swear means. So he swore to your fathers. Now, then it gives a description of who the fathers is. To Abraham, which was a very rich man. To Isaac, who was a very rich man, financially, provisionally, materialistically. To Jacob, who was a very rich man. He swore to them that you would come out of them and you would have the same lifestyle that they had. Glory unto God. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. 
Saints, I'm I'm I'm, talk, I'm I'm talking I'm talking to the church here. I'm talking to the church here. He said the life that they live of blessing and prosperity and goodness and finances and favor and glory and power. I'm going to give it to you that come after them. I'm showing you how Abraham lived. Genesis chapter 13, verse 2. Abraham is very rich in silver and in gold. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 22 says, A good man leaveth an inheritance for his children's children. And the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the just. A good man leaveth an inheritance for his children's children. Proverbs 13, 22. So that, that's saying that when you a good man, a godly man, You'll have enough money to pass down to not only your children, but their children. So that's a financial outpouring of God. That's a financial outpouring of the Holy Ghost. If we stick to the word of God and the word of God is truth. Let God be true. Let every man be a liar. That's what the word says. I think that's in Romans. Let God be true and every man a liar. If we stick to the word of God and not go to the left or to the right. If we stick to the word, that's Romans chapter three, verse four. If we stick to the word, Romans three, four says, let God be true. And every man a liar. If we stick to the word of God and we live by the word of God and like James 1 say that you be a doer of the word. If you are a doer of the word, this is the blessing that comes upon you. Saints, this is why you got to keep your ear to God's mouth. You got to keep your ear to what the father is saying. Luke chapter 12 verse 32 says Fear not, little flock, for it is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Fear not, little flock, for it is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. I think that's Luke chapter 12, verse 32. It is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Now, saints, in his kingdom, it is revealed in Revelation chapter 5, verse 1. In his kingdom is riches. In his kingdom is strength. That's why I said that I could do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. In his kingdom is riches. That's why Proverbs chapter 8 verse 18 says, riches and righteousness are with me. Righteousness and riches. In Proverbs chapter 8 verse 18. Then Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 18. You remember the Lord your God, for it is he that giveth thee the power to get wealth. All of these is dealing with the kingdom system. The kingdom system is in Revelation 5.12. It's riches. It is, uh, it is blessing. It's power. It's strength. It's wisdom. Luke 2.52, Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 5. Get, if wi get wisdom. Get understanding. Proverbs chapter 4, verse... Uh, Verse five talked about you not letting yourself decline from the words of God's mouth. You stick into the word. You're not going to the left or to the right. No, that's actually um, Proverbs chapter four, verse five, I believe. Proverbs four, five. Dealing with you sticking with the words of God's mouth. And then since I think that's Proverbs chapter four. Uh, Proverbs chapter four, verse five says that uh, if you don't forsake wisdom, she shall preserve thee. If you love her, she, she gonna protect you. She gonna keep you, but you have to love her. You gotta keep her at the center of your, 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 your focus, your decisions. And what is that wisdom of God is the kingdom system. We find out the kingdom system is in Mark chapter four, verse 26 through 30. Mark chapter four, verse 26 to 30, that the kingdom of heaven is like a man that sows his seed into the ground. He sows his seed into the ground and he goes to sleep and he knoweth not how and the seed come back to him as a harvest. That's what the kingdom is all about. It's about 
you operating in a sowing anointing with you and God. It's a partnership with you and the father. That's what the kingdom all about. The kingdom is about a sowing anointing that's given to you and a reaping anointing that's given to you so that your life could look like what the father promised Abraham your life was going to look like. He promised Isaac what your life was going to look like. And he promised Jacob what your life was going to look, look like. He told them all what you was going to have. He told them, I'm going to make them rich. I'm going to make them wealthy. I'm going to make their name great. That's Genesis chapter 12. In Genesis chapter 12, it was an eye-opening text because God is telling Abraham that those that come out of him will be rich just like him and even bigger. In Genesis chapter 12, God is saying to Abraham that there's going to be families that will be blessed by you. That's the word of God. That's the word of God. Genesis chapter 12, the father said there's going to be people that come out of you, Abraham. There's going to be generations that come out of you, nations of people that come out of you that's going to serve me and they're going to have your blessing validifying them as a reward system. I'm going to reward them with your blessing. That, go, that brings us into, uh, into Galatians chapter 3. Verse 13, how Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law being made uh, a curse for us. And verse 14 says that the blessing of Abraham has come upon you as you're in Christ Jesus and you have received the promise of the spirit. That's Galatians chapter three, verse 14. So the blessing of Abraham is a result of you being born again. Remember Nicodemus came to King Jesus and said, what, what does born again mean? Do I go back into my mother's womb? And King Jesus told him about being born of the spirit, being born of the spirit in the book of Peter. It talked about that you are born not of corruptible seed, but the incorruptible seed of the word of God. That's what the Bible say. That's what the Bible say. So when, when we look in depth at the blessing of Abraham, this blessing of Abraham is a lifestyle of pleasure and prosperity. Job chapter 36 verse 11 says, it says that if you obey and serve him, you'll spend your days in prosperity and your years in pleasures. Joel chapter two says that I restore unto you the years that the locusts have eaten, the canker worm, the palmer worm, and the locust, the caterpillar. I'll restore back unto those, those years back unto you. So saints, when we deal with this blessing of Abraham, this promise that God swore, he swore to, uh, he swore to the people of God Proverbs chapter four, verse six says, forsake her not, she shall preserve thee. Love her and she shall keep thee. So Proverbs four, six. Proverbs four, six says, uh, forsake her not and she shall preserve thee. And then it says, if you love her, she shall keep thee. That's Proverbs chapter four, verse six. And this wisdom of God is, is going to have you live out the same lifestyle that Abraham lived of sowing and reaping. That's what the kingdom is all about, sowing and reaping, giving and receiving, unselfishness and reward. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse six says, without faith is impossible to please God. It says, let him that cometh to God he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of they that diligently seek him. I believe that's Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. That you must believe that he is a rewarder of him that seeks him. He that comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of they that seek him. So you already have to get this recognition that the Father already did it, for Abraham. He already did it for Isaac. So when you come to the Lord, you have to believe that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. 
You know what that's all about? That's about you going all the way in the kingdom system, never becoming discouraged, never becoming double-minded, never getting angry, never getting offended, never getting distracted, never getting corrupted, never getting sidetracked, never getting satanically influenced, never allowing yourself to fall to weakness, never allowing yourself to be condemned, never allowing yourself to doubt, to worry, to fear. The Bible said in gospels, in the gospels, Take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, what you shall drink, what you shall wear. For the Gentiles worry about these things. It says that your father already knows what you have need of. He already knows what you have need of. So when you come into the Lord and you're, you're, you're confronting the will of God for your life, you have to have full confidence that he is a rewarder of they that diligently seek him in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. You can't come to him double-minded because in James chapter one, it says that any man that comes to God double-minded, let not that man think that he'll receive anything from the Lord. So Saints James chapter one shows you that when faith is not present, it cancels out receptivity. John chapter one, verse 12, to as many as received him, that's the law of receptivity. To as many as receive him, he gave them the power. See, power flows off of receptivity. Power flows off of the law of receptivity. So even Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18, that power to get wealth is from the receptivity of the kingdom system. So let's go back to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 10. Deuteronomy chapter six, verse 10 says this. It says, uh, and it shall be that when the Lord your God shall bring, shall have brought thee into the land which he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities. To give thee great and goodly cities. See, the blessing of Abraham is to give you a city. Saints, I don't say this well, I'm going to say it with power. I'm not worried about Dallas, Texas, because this is my city. Now, I'm talking about spiritually. So this my city. So I have a voice in this city. I'm not worried about hurricanes. I'm not worried about natural disasters. I'm not worried about uh, satanic activity because I have authority and I have a voice. And I have power to stand against the powers that be in this proximity per se. I'm just giving you an example. You do also, when you submit yourself unto God and you choose to be focused on the Lord Jesus, pursue him, let him possess you, let him take over your life, let the spirit have full control over you. It says in Genesis, uh, uh, Deuteronomy 6 verse 10, that he will give you great and goodly cities. That's more than one. He'll give you authority over cities. This is the blessing of Abraham. Now we know why in James chapter five, I believe, James chapter five, verse 17 and on, it says Elijah was a man like us with like passions like us, but he prayed earnestly for God to shut up the heavens that it might not rain. He prayed earnestly that it might not rain and it did not rain for the space of Three years and six months. That's James chapter five, verse 17 and on. It said that it did not rain for a space of three years and six months. He had authority over the weather for three years and six months, three years, he was able to govern over the weather in his city. And there's a one greater than Elijah here. There's a one greater than Moses here. There's Jesus, the son of the living God, living in earthen vessels. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is dwelling in your mortal body. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. I'm not mad at you. If you get mad at my message, I'm not worried about you. This blessing me. I believe the word of God. This blessing me. I believe the word of God. I'm a blessed man. I live in the blessing. This blessing me. I'm living this word. I'm living this word. If you don't like this word, you missing out because this word is living, it's quick, it's powerful. It runs swiftly throughout the earth and it brings results. And Abraham believed this word. He became rich. Isaac believed this word. He became rich. Jacob believed this word. He became rich. All of them lived out in the reward system of God. Why? Because they was diligently seeking him. And how was they diligently seeking him? In Genesis chapter 12. The Bible says that Abraham built an altar where he was sowing into God. See, they not only believe God with their mouth, they believe God with their money, their currency, their provision. They was walking in Proverbs chapter three, verse nine. They was honoring the Lord with their substance. Are you seeing this? All of them made up in their mind, we're going to build an altar and we're going to worship God with everything that he puts in our hands. When he put money in our hands, we're going to sanctify a portion of that money and we're going to lift it up to the work of God and we're going to push his gospel. We're going to push his kingdom. We're going to push his vision. All of them walked in the kingdom system of sowing and reaping and all of them lived in riches. The blessing of Abraham is a mindset to sow and a mindset to reap. The blessing of Abraham, it is freedom from sin. The blessing of Abraham is obedience to divine instructions. The blessing of Abraham is believing the prophet. The blessing of Abraham is receiving a prophet in the name of a prophet, receiving the prophet's reward. The blessing of Abraham is living in houses you did not build, wells you did not dig, vineyards you did not plant. This is all the blessing of Abraham that favor will come to you and they'll shield you. Psalm chapter 5 verse 12 says that the favor favor of the Lord shall surround you as with a shield. That's Psalm 512. The favor of God is a shield. Ephesians 6 said that faith is a shield. So faith and favor are both shields. Abraham not only operated in favor, but he operated in faith. Romans 10 told you that faith coming to you by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That means that Abraham was a lover of the word of God. Abraham was a lover of prophetic instructions. Abraham was a lover of divine counsel, divine wisdom, divine knowledge, divine mentorship. He was a lover of correction, a lover of rebuke, a lover of discipline, deliverance, diligence. He loved divine methodologies and strategies from God being downloaded into his soul for him to walk in. He was obedient. Remember in Genesis chapter 26, how God began to boast to Isaac about the obedience of his father, how his father was obedient to God. Remember how the father had a good report about Abraham, how Abraham was a listener, how Abraham was a student, how Abraham was submissive, how Abraham kept his statutes, how Abraham kept his testimonies, how Abraham didn't go to the left or to the right, how Abraham loved truth, how Abraham walked in freedom, walked in consistency, walked in faithfulness, walked in the blessing, walked in the, in the empowerment of the spirit. The empowerment of the spirit was constantly moving through Abraham and he was a leader. He took God's instruction and he did it. He didn't worry about who left him. He didn't worry about who agreed with him. He didn't worry about who was with him. He did it at all costs because Abraham had made his allegiance to God and God alone. So saints, think about it. When the blessing of Abraham is on you, it is also a loyalty to the father. You're not worried about persecution. You're not worried about people disagreeing with you. You're not worried about persecution. You're not worried about hatred or rejection. You're not worried about Goliath. You're constantly caring for the heart of the father. You're looking towards his heart and making sure that he gets pleasure from your life. 
That's the power of the blessing of Abraham. Abraham. It is an anointing that's given to you so that you could be a pleasurable experience to God, so that you could satisfy God, so that you could give him what he desires from you, so that you could minister to him. You could minister to him. You could minister to him. The blessing of Abraham is the ability to minister to God. It's the ability to give him everything that you have, everything that you are, and not hold back anything because of your own understanding, but you give everything to him. Uh, Proverbs chapter three, verse five through six, it says that acknowledge the Lord in all your ways. He'll direct your paths. Trust in the Lord. Uh, verse five, Proverbs chapter three, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. Proverbs chapter three, verse five says, lean not to your own understanding. Abraham blessing when it comes upon you, it is an empowerment to not lean to your own understanding. It's an empowerment. It's an ability that the father gives you so that you don't walk with natural wisdom. Romans 12 says, don't be conformed to this world. You don't walk with natural understanding. The Bible says that the natural man understandeth not the things of the spirit for they are spiritually, they're spiritually crippled. They're spiritually blind. They can't understand it. But see, Abraham was understanding the way of God and he chose to listen to it. And he lived a rich life in his generation. He lived in abundance in his generation. He lived in increase in his generation. He lived in divine health in his generation. He lived with power over the enemy. He lived with power over the prince of the power of the air. He lived with power over principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this age and the spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly places. Abraham lived at the top of the mountain because he decided to humble himself underneath the mighty hand of God and God was exalting him. God was lifting him up and since that same blessing has come upon you and the Lord has already reserved a good life for you. He has already reserved every money that you will unlock. He has already reserved all the health that you're going to walk in. He already reserved all the favor that you're going to have with God and with men. He has already reserved all of the open doors that you're going to receive. He has already reserved. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He has reserved everything that pertains to life and godliness. He has already reserved it for you. He has already made provision for tomorrow. He has already blessed you in the city, blessed you in the field, blessed you coming in, blessed you coming out. You have already been marked as a recipient of the blessing of Abraham. Don't miss it. So when we go to Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 10, it says that he'll give you great and goodly cities. Now let's go to verse 11. It says, and houses full of all good things. This is the inheritance of God. It said that he was going to give you houses full of all good things. He said that he was going to give you houses. Listen what God is saying. Not what people say. The Lord said, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 11 that he going to give you houses of all good things. Some of you are watching me right now. You're looking at your apartment. You're looking at your income. You're looking at your annual income. You're looking at your boss. You're looking at how you're living now. You're looking at all this stuff in the natural. We not dealing with the natural. We dealing with a supernatural God that got supernatural power to get anything to you at any time from anywhere by any means necessary. We dealing with a kingdom that can't be stopped. If you yield to this kingdom, this kingdom works for you. If you yield to this kingdom, you'll see the good of the land. Isaiah 119 says, if you're willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. You shall eat it. Psalm 34 verse 10, it says that the young lions, they are the ones that lack. They are the ones that suffer hunger. But those that seek the Lord shall not want for anything. Psalm 23 verse 1 says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. These are all the father is doing in the word. He's molding you into looking to him, which is the author and the finisher of your faith. He's molding you to look at his system, to look at his power, to look at his ability, to look at his grace. 
2 Corinthians chapter 9 says that God is able to make all his grace abound towards you, that you always have an all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance to every good work. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8 and on. That God is able to make all his grace abound towards you. That you always have an all sufficiency and all things may have an abundance to every good work. See, there go that word abundance again. And then John 10, 10, you all know it, that he came to give you life and life more abundantly. But what's stopping that life? The thief, the thief coming but to steal, to kill, destroy. The thief is a spirit that governs tradition. That even makes the word of God none effect. The thief works through procrastination. The thief works through uh, 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 self-righteousness. The thief works through uh, a stony heart. A thief works through a stony heart. I think that's Ezekiel chapter 26. Talked about that stony heart. A thief works through all the things that cancel out money cometh, harvests, provision, wealth, the anointing of wealth, the blessing of Abraham, the blessing of the Lord, like Proverbs 10, 22, it said that it makes you rich. That stony heart, see the thief works through all these different uh, systematic weapons, fiery darts, that affect the heart of man to make you fearful, to make you believe in what Satan is showing you your life is today. And so that you don't receive the life that God has for you in all actuality. Are you living the life that God wants you to live fully? No, you're not. And that's the hope that you have because you have not arrived yet. It's not over yet. You haven't seen the full picture yet. Saints, when I was walking my walk with the father in my earlier years, I knew it wasn't over yet. When I, when I went into homelessness, I knew it wasn't over yet. When I had to stay in people's houses, I knew it wasn't over yet. When I had to stay in hotel rooms, I knew it wasn't over yet. When I had to go to the shelter for days, I knew it wasn't over yet. When it looked like a door wasn't opening for me, I knew it wasn't over yet. When it looked like I didn't have much money, I knew it wasn't over yet. When it seemed like you don't have family, you don't have brother, sister, mother, father, I knew it wasn't over yet. I knew it wasn't over yet. And I stuck and I stayed steadfast, immovable, abounding in the work of the Lord. You'll have to keep yourself in the grace of hope. Remember what Proverbs says that hope deferred makes the heart sick. Hope deferred make the heart sick. When you're operating in hope, you have power to not get weary. When you operate in hope, you reject Galatians 6, 9. You refuse to be weary. You refuse to faint because you will not cancel out the harvest of what God promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that he would do for you. Saints, I want you to understand you living a big life is bigger than just you. God promised it to men that were gods in the spirit. They were kings in the spirit and God made a covenant oath with them and told Abraham, I'm promising you, I'm going to make everybody that listen to me live your type of life. I'm going to take them into the double of your life. I'm going to take them into the unlimited realm of your lifestyle. This lifestyle where you got increase and abundance and more than enough and wealth being transferred to you when you get around kings and you coming out with more than you came in with and you keep on multiplying and you keep on going to the next level of increase. I'm going to make that happen to everybody that chooses to serve me. God made an oath. With Abraham, that's verse 10. Now let's go to verse 11. It says, and houses full of all good things. Once again, the Bible promising you houses. And then it says house of all houses of all good things. Then what else did it say there? And let me just say this. Some of y'all get mad because I'm wearing jewelry. Baby, you think that you're going to heaven? 
You think that you're going to heaven? You think King Jesus going to let you into heaven with your broke mindset? You think that you're going to come up to heaven and tell King Jesus, take that crown off of your head Why you got all that gold on? Baby, if you don't like nobody wearing gold and jewelry, you're going to drop in the pit of hell because ain't nobody got no gold and jewelry down there. Everybody is broke. Everybody ain't got no silver or gold. Ain't nobody got no nice things in hell. Everybody burning up and suffering. Heaven is a place where there's streets of gold, there is onyx, there's burnix, they got all type of jewelry you ain't never heard before. So if you got a problem with jewelry down here, you ain't making it to heaven. God ain't going to have you up there disrespecting his protocol, his scenery, how he like things to be done. God like jewelry, God like gold, God like the blessing. In the book of Job, chapter 42, the Bible started talking about how they gave Job gold. They gave him gold. God loves jewelry. God loves gold. He loves silver. He loves things that are vibrant and beautiful. So if you don't like the gold down here on earth, you're not going to heaven. So prepare. Prepare now. Just look at yourself today. If gold and jewelry bother you to see a man of God, that's a king, I'm royalty, I am a champion, I have overcome the gates of hell, ain't no demon got power over me, I have never lost a battle to Satan. If you mad at somebody like me wearing gold, something is seriously wrong with you because I deserve all the gold that I wear. I work hard. I do the work of God and I'm doing the highest level of work that can be done. Anybody that saves souls, the Bible says that he that wins souls is wise. That's what the Bible says. Anybody that wins souls, I'm a soul winning king and I'm winning souls all across the world. I deserve, the Bible says, mark the elder that ruleth well and give him double honor. That's what the word says. Give him double honor. That's what the Bible says. That's what the Bible says. It says, give him double honor. So this is what we're dealing with. We're dealing with this supernatural realm of the blessing. Now, since let's go over to uh, Deuteronomy chapter six. Now, by the way, I'm not just talking to you. I live what I'm talking about. You hear me talking about houses? You hear me talking about all this different type of stuff? I live what I'm talking to you about. So I'm not a hypocrite. In James chapter three, verse 17, said that that wisdom from above, it is first pure, it is uh, peaceable, it's gentle, it's easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits. It says that it's without partiality and without hypocrisy. So the wisdom that I'm talking about right here is without hypocrisy. I'm not lying to you. I live this, what I'm talking about. So I'm not talking to you about the blessing of Abraham. I am the blessing of Abraham. I'm in the blessing of Abraham now. So I'm talking to you about a realm that I live in. So I'm, I'm not speaking to you as an experimental suggestion. This is not an experimental suggestion. I'm talking to you as a, a, a recipient of this. I live this out. So what I'm doing right now is I'm showing you all these different aspects in which you are supposed to be walking in this as well. So you're looking at somebody that has this. So I'm speaking this to you not to knock you down, but to lift you up. And see, I'm an example. I'm one of the examples. God have many examples on earth of people that have conquered this blessing of Abraham and they're releasing it to their people. I'm, I'm, I'm coming as a hand lifted up to lift you up into this. You see? So, so I, I'm encouraging you. I'm pushing you like a coach, like a trainer. I'm showing you that it can be done. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So this lifestyle is not something that we're experimenting. I'm in this myself. I sow and I reap. I live in the blessing of Abraham. I live in the harvest. Now, saints, I'm a leader and I have many sowers in my life. I have many people that sow into me. Like old girl was on here crying out. She's still on here. She obsessed with me. She crying out 
talking about she not going to give me no money. Baby, I don't need your $2. <laughs> Baby, I don't need your $2. I don't need no money from you. Keep your money. I don't need your two dollars. I'm, I'm a blessing. Blessing you on this land. Those of you all that got wisdom on here, I'm giving you the path that leads to e eternal life, abundant life. I'm showing you how to do it. I'm showing you how to do it. Now, saints, let's go. Let's go to uh, verse eleven here. And houses of all good things that thou fillest not. Now, what is verse 11 saying? That I'm going to give you houses. Not only am I going to give you houses, <laughs> I'm not only going to give you houses, but what I'm going to do? I'm going to give you houses that are full of things that by favor... I'm placing these things in there. You're not going to have to toil to go get furniture. You're not going to have to toil to get bedroom sets and toil to get TVs, toil to get uh, uh, dishware and all these different type of things. Verse 11 is saying that God going to give you houses full of all good things. And then it says that as a result, you're not even going to be the one that put all these good things in. You're not going to be the one. I'm going to put these good things in by favor. In Proverbs chapter 24, it talks about how through knowledge, a house is filled with riches. Through knowledge. Now, now what is the knowledge that uh, Proverbs 24 is talking about? It's talking about the knowledge of Wisdom, the kingdom system, the blessing of Abraham, how this thing flows. So when you get that type of knowledge on the inside of you, what you're carrying an atmosphere for God to bring provision to you. You're carrying an atmosphere for God to bring increase to you. You're carrying an atmosphere for God to bring that overflow, that plenty to you. So he wants you to get the knowledge on the inside of you. See, saints, what, I, what I'm doing is I'm in this scripture meditation. I'm teaching my son to do this as well. I'm teaching y'all to do this. Where it's like this meditation of the word, it does something on the inside of you to make you ponder the word. So in uh, Psalm chapter one, verse two, and we see all throughout the life of Moses, the life of Joshua, when he takes his leadership, the life of David, they're constantly bringing themselves into the knowledge of the word. They're meditating the word. They're keeping their self engrafted in the word. And while they're engrafted in the word, what God is doing is he's making things happen for them on the outside by angelic ministry. Angels are doing things because they are reverencing the word on the inside of them. Think about this. On the inside of them, as they're listening to the word, they're meditating the word. The father is causing angels to do things on the outside for them, removing the demonic powers, removing satanic interference, bringing them into the lifestyle that they're supposed to live, all because they're hiding the word in their heart. If we look at David, if we look at Solomon, look at how Solomon wrote in Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. Look how Solomon is so wise concerning the word of God. Number one, he listened to David. David listened to Samuel. Samuel listened to Eli. Eli was fallen according to his current state, but he still had information. Because remember what he told, he had prophetic information. Remember when Samuel heard a voice and he thought it was Eli. Eli said, go tell the Lord, speak Lord for your servant heareth. Your servant is listening. So he had prophetic information. What you have to see is, God was giving Eli the wisdom to give to Samuel since Samuel was about to take the throne. Samuel was about to take the position, take the office, take the priesthood, take that grace to walk in leading people and guiding people and pastoring people. God knew that. So he let 
Eli transferred the information to Samuel, which is very powerful because what we're seeing how these people valued the word. That's why they were so effective. They hid the word in their heart. They meditated the word. So when we see Samuel ministering to God, why is he ministering to God like that? Because he has Eli training him. Why is David operating in kingship? Now, he was a shepherd boy, but he got promoted to kingship. Who anointed him? Samuel. So Samuel taught him what kings do. So when Nathan came to Samuel, uh, came to David rather, and rebuked him for his sin, remember David repented because he was already taught by his prophet how to respond as a king. That's why David did not kill Saul because he had Samuel as his prophet teaching him the word. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. And saints, this all go back into the blessing of Abraham. Abraham was teaching Lot how to win the war. Remember when Lot disconnected from Abraham, he lost everything because his power, his connection, his strength, his victory was all inside of his mentor. It was inside of Abraham. So the minute that Lot goes into <laughs> the minute that Lot goes into having Lot goes into having um, that disconnection from Abraham, he loses everything. So saints, what I want you to see is this: whenever the Holy Spirit is placing the blessing of Abraham on you. Abraham was a prophet. So he's going to have a prophet assigned to you that's going to be teaching you. The blessing of Abraham is something that shifts the prophet right in your face. The prophet going to be teaching you and mentoring you so that you can come into the lifestyle that God swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. See, it's the prophet's reward. It's the prophet's reward. Saints, why I'm laughing? Because the same female is still on the line. <laughs> I'm laughing because you're saying that I'm false, but you're still watching me. You haven't left the line yet. You haven't left. So, so what we're going to do is we're going to give you permission to leave the line. <laughs> if you obsess with me, just say that. You obsess. Listen, if you love watching me, just say that. You're saying all this stuff, but you're watching me. You, I have, I'm, ruling your, uh, I'm ruling your control. I'm ruling your focus. I'm ruling your mind right now. I got your phone. Your data is watching me. I got full authority over your phone. So you saying that I'm false, but I got power over your phone right now. You can't turn me off. So, so if I'm so, if I'm so powerless, how I got power over you, I got power over your time. You could be anywhere right now doing anything, but you right here listening to my words. I got power over you. So just remember that those of you are that are hecklers. Just remember, you listening to me talk. If you addicted to me, just say that. Amazing. If you think that I'm this and that, remember, you can't stop watching me. I'm ruling your phone. I got authority. Where your boyfriend at? Give me the, I want to call your boyfriend right now on the line. Give me his number. Let me call him and tell him that his girl on my line listening to me. Does he know that you here? Come on, give, give, me, give me a phone number. Because I, I got authority over your phone right now. You saying all this different type of stuff, but you watching me, baby. You watching me. I'm not watching you. You watching me. <laughs> you, 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 listen, you've been talking from the beginning of the broadcast. How long I've been on this broadcast now? 
I've been on this broadcast for, let me see how long I've been dominating you. I've been dominant. I've been on this line for over 50 minutes. You've been with me for over 15 minutes. I've never seen somebody talk about Jordans being fake, but they at the Jordan store for 50 minutes shopping. I've never seen that done. I've never seen somebody at a place scorning it and then they shopping at the same place for over 50 minutes. You've been here for over 15 minutes. You dismiss. If you can't leave this line, it's because you're addicted to me. Just say that. You ain't got to criticize me. If you're addicted to me, just say that. Because if you were so, uh, uh, if you were so, if you were so, you, you would have done left. We are the way going into an hour and you still here just talking. Now, either you crazy because you got a lot of stuff to say, but you real crazy if you could be on this line for all this period of time talking to yourself and you never met me, I never met you, and you could be talking to me. That sound real crazy. Would I go over to someone's house and I start talking to them and I never met them before and they never met me before and I talk for over 50 minutes? They will call the police on me. So baby, you're making yourself look bad. The whole world be watching me. So be very careful. If you want a husband in the future, you don't want your man see you on this line. You don't want your man seeing you on this line acting crazy because now he got a track record to know what type of what type of cycle you is. So calm down. Me and you ain't got no children. I wouldn't dux you if you was the last woman on the earth. Calm down. Calm down, baby. We ain't got no children together. I'm not paying you no child support. I'm not trying to be with you. Me and you ain't got no relationship. We ain't never going to have no relationship. So just go on about your business. There's other men. There's other men out here. Me and you not together. You not my wife. Me and you, we not girlfriend. I don't want to be with you. Calm down. Let's snap. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 11. It says, and houses full of all good things which thou fillest not. Then it says, and wells dig, which thou diggest not. Vineyards and olive trees, which thou plantest not. And then it says, when thou shalt have eaten and are full. What then it, it said in verse, uh, verse uh, 12, it says, then beware lest you forget the Lord. It's telling you not to forget God. Remember I told you, that God gives you wealth to target your memory. He don't want you to forget him. He don't want you to lose the greatness of who he is in your mind. He wants you to stay fascinated with him. Saints, all these things that God does for you when he blesses you, he gives you increase, he gives you prosperity, is because he wants to magnify himself to you and he wants you to praise him, worship him, bow down to him, make him your undivided attention. That's why he does it. Saints, a lot of times the Lord be doing stuff for you and you forget it so quickly. Some of y'all got vehicles, you don't even thank God for the vehicle no more. You got houses, you got a house, you got an apartment, you don't thank him for it no more. When you got into it, now you was thanking God, you was praising God. But when time went by, you stopped doing it. When time went by, you stopped following the pattern of gratefulness and gratitude. Saints, there's many things that you have right now that you should be praising God for that you don't praise him for no more. Some of you are used to have sickness in your youth. You used to have sickness in your past and you don't got that same sickness, but you won't praise God. You act like what God did for you is a far, a, a good thing and you no longer acknowledge him for it. There's some of you are this year, you didn't get COVID and some of y'all got COVID, you didn't die from it, but you won't even praise him you acting like, oh, okay, I'm alive still. I'm still waiting on God to do something for me. Why are you not praising him that he delivered you from COVID-19? Why are you not praising him that you still got a job when everybody losing a job? 
Why are you not praising him that you got a roof over your head? Even if you had a shelter, you still alive. Why don't you take the opportune times to praise God and celebrate him for the things that he's constantly doing for you? Even if you got life in your body. Every day of your life is so easy for you to forget yesterday's miracles, yesterday's mercy, yesterday's favor, yesterday's protection, yesterday's grace, yesterday's patience of God, yesterday, the long suffering of God. And there's constant moments where the Lord is waving your sin and waving your unrighteousness and waving your flaws and waving your mistakes. And he's giving you mercy and you're still waiting for him to do something else. And you're not even celebrating the moment in time where he's treating you not as your sins deserve. He's treating you not as your sins deserve. You should be in hell. You should be dead. You should be punished. You should be stricken. But he's still giving you life and moments for you to get it right with him, for you to change, for you to repent, for you to get saved from the wrath to come, for you to get delivered from hell fire, from you to get set free from flaws and addictions, bad habits and sins and iniquities and wrongdoings and wrong thoughts and vain imaginations. He giving you power to trample over the serpent and the scorpion and all the powers of the enemy. So nothing by any means shall be able to hurt you. Luke chapter 10 verse 19. He giving you the power over the enemy. What are you doing with all of the things that God is doing to impress you? Saints, the father was talking to me about this. The word of the Lord came to me about this. And he says, son, I do things to impress people. I do things to get people's attention. My motive for doing it because I want them to worship me. I'm God. I made them to worship me. So I make stuff happen right in their face, whether it be that somebody has a murder charge and you pray for them, you sow a seed for them and they get off. We got one of the daughters in the ministry, one of uh, some, something crazy happened and the child was going to jail. They sold a thousand dollar seed to me. They said that their child got off of that case. They watching. I don't know if they, they, they want me to voice their name, so I won't do it. But if, if they feel free, they can say something. But how many times where things are supposed to be done a certain way? And the father intervenes and shows you his greatness. And then you act normal. Don't act normal. Be fascinated with God. He loves that. Act like he's the boss. Act like he's the king. Talk to King Jesus in your prayer life as if he is all that. Don't come to him talking about, Lord, when you going to do this for me? Why you ain't do this for me yet? Say, Lord, you so good. You so amazing. You so spectacular. I want to be just like you. Make me like you. Make me into a pleasurable experience for you. Make me into your joy. Make me into your peace. Make me into your pleasure. Make me into your happiness. I'm in love with you. I like you. I enjoy you, Lord Jesus. Tell him like that. Talk to him like that and see how much miracles happen to you. When you talk to the Lord Jesus, don't talk to him like he's your child, like he's your kid. Talk to him like he's your creator. Talk to him. Even in the book of Ecclesiastes, it says, make your words few when you talk to God. Make your words few. Don't say a lot of stuff. Don't talk to him as if he, he's a joke. Make your words few. Why does it say make your words few? Because that's how you act when you respect somebody. When you respect somebody, you, you let your words be few. When you respect somebody, you, 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 you monitor what comes out of your lips. You are very close to, to discretion. You stay in discretion and you say, I'm not going to say something to aggravate this person. I'm not going to say something to rub them the wrong way. Why? Because you respect them. Hallelujah. 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 So saints, when we deal with verse 11, I'm going to give you houses of all good things, which thou fillest not and wells dig, which thou diggest not. Do you know what that mean? Wells represent provision, provisional streams, provisional miracles. That mean that God going to be giving you stuff to enhance your life, benefit your life, 
increase your life. He's going to be blessing you with things to increase you. And he's going to do it supernaturally. You didn't deal these, dig these wells, but yet they are dug because God did it for you supernaturally. Digging a well is like a portal. It's a portal of provision, provisions, more than one stream, more than one avenue of God getting money to you, provision to you, progress to you, prosperity to you, advancement to you. It's more than one stream. So since when the word of God started speaking on there about you're going to have houses full of all good things, which thou fillest not. You didn't even fill your house with all these things. God going to bring you furniture, bring you lavish things, luxury. And then he said that you'll have wells that thou diggest not. That's streams of provision that you yourself, you could not do that in yourself. It was the working of angels behind the scenes. It was God dealing with the people's hearts and bringing them into a desire to be nice to you, to open up a door for you, to give you an opportunity in their business, in their workplace, to connect with your work of your hands and increase it and promote it and advertise it and give it a good name. It is all God's doing. Verse 11. And then it says, vineyards and olive trees, which thou planteth not. Saints, here we go with more provisions. Here we go with more of God giving you supernatural power to get wealth. It said that you didn't plant these things, but they are now serving you. They're benefiting you. This is all supernatural money, supernatural provision, supernatural increase. See, I'm showing you in the word of God. That's what we mean when we say supernatural money moving. That's what we mean when we say money cometh, because this is the system of the kingdom of heaven now supplying you and giving you more than you ever had. This is God's doing. This is God's power. I feel the glory of God. Lebroste keleva kalama sunda la maya. Roro do bossi. Ila la mandele veke. Rasto, rata, rede, robosuto. We give God all the glory. We give God all the praise. We give God all the power in here. We give God all the power in here. We give God all the power. We give the Lord all the power. All the power belongs to God. It says that. You didn't plant these vineyards and olive trees. And look what it says at the end. It says, when you have eaten, when thou shalt have eaten and you be full, it's saying when you are satisfied, Psalm 103, talk about he'll satisfy your mouth with good things. It's saying that when you are satisfied, when you are satisfied, when you're in a place where you're saying, I got too much. I'm enjoying myself. I'm having so much fun. Look what it says in verse 12. It says, beware, then beware that you forget not the Lord. Don't forget him. Keep on reminding yourself of every gift that God has given to you. The reason why we disrespect God is because we forget what he gave us. We forget how he has invested in us. And then we forget that to whom much is given, much is required. So when much is being required, we disrespect the requirement because we disrespected the investment. We forgot how much was given to us. So then when we get required of us much, we forget how to respond because we forgot that there was already much given to us. So now the response is disrespect to the much that's required from us. It says, forget not the Lord, forget not the Lord, forget not the Lord, forget not the Lord, forget not the Lord. And look what it says, forget not the Lord. Verse 12, that brought thee forth from the land of Egypt, from the house of bondage. So you have to remember I used to be a sinner. I used to be stuck underneath Satan's grip. I used to be underneath the powers of the devil. I used to serve the satanic kingdom. I used to listen to demons. But now the Lord has delivered me out 
and brought me forth out of the land of Egypt, the land of sinners, the land of slaves, the land of victims, the land of the defeated, the land of losers, the land of the cursed. He has brought me forth from this land of the children of darkness, the sons and the daughters of disobedience, the, the land of witches and warlocks, the land of rebels and devils, the land of the defiled and the corrupt. Are you seeing this? Hallelujah. It says, don't forget the Lord that brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt, out of the land of bondage. Then it says, from the house of bondage. And in verse 13 says, thou shalt fear the Lord and serve him and swear by his name. It says, thou shalt fear the Lord. That means to hold him in high regard, to respect him, to never trespass against him. That's what fear God means. It's to talk to him as if he is a king to also only let his words proceed out of your mouth, to only let his deeds proceed out of your body, your behavior, to receive his will for your life, his schedule for your life, the path that he picked for you. The fear of God is to depart from evil, is the beginning of wisdom. And so it says that you shall fear the Lord. Fear the Lord and shall serve him. See, fear brings you into servanthood. Fear brings you into servanthood. When you fear God, it increases your servanthood. The level that you fear God is the level that you serve God. The level that you fear God, if you take a note, you can write that down. That's a wisdom door. The level that you fear God is the level that you serve God. It says that you fear him. That you fear him and serve him and swear by his name. What does that mean? Swear means that you create a covenant, an oath, a marriage with you and God by his name. Because his name is established, is higher than principalities and powers, is higher than any demonic thing, is higher than things above, things on earth and things below. It is the greatest name that exists. So you swear by his name, you make an oath by the highest level of weapon that exists, the name of the Lord Jesus. And then it says that you swear by his name, you make a covenant, you marry the name of the Lord Jesus. You marry him. We know that the name is now the Lord Jesus. We know that's in the Old Testament, but now we see the manifestation. Remember what uh, John chapter one says, that he was the word made flesh and dwelt among us and we all beheld his glory. So now we see the manifestation of the name of the Lord. Proverbs says that the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and they are safe. But now we see that now in the New Testament, the angel tell Mary that this, his name shall be called Jesus and he shall save his people from their sins. So when it says that the name of the Lord was a strong tower, the righteous run to it and they are safe, they are saved. So this is the name of Jesus. So when we look at, when we look at uh, Deuteronomy chapter, Deuteronomy chapter six, verse uh, 13, we're looking at the name of Jesus that you're swearing by. You're making an oath. That's what swear means. You're making an oath and saying, I choose to serve the true and living God. I choose to let go of my addictions, the things that I'm struggling with, and I choose to serve the living God and become one with him. That word swear also means to build an oath, to build a covenant, to become one. How could two walk together lest they be agreed? That oneness in the book of Corinthians, I believe it says that you are joined to the Lord and you are one spirit. You are joined to the Lord and you are one spirit. Remember the Bible says that there's one Lord, there's one spirit. Now, in verse 14, it says that you shall not go after other gods. You shall not go after the gods of the people that are round about you. That means that don't let yourself get influenced by demonic people. Don't let people and the lifestyle that they live in, don't, don't conform to it. Don't give in to it. Don't let them become your role model. Don't let their spirit start influencing you. Don't be enticed, seduced. Don't be amused, entertained by the lifestyle of people that's not serving the Lord Jesus. 
Don't let them influence you. That's what it means. You shall not go after other gods. Gods means that something that you worship and worship is dealing with uh, you giving your time over to this thing. You giving your moments over to this thing, your body over to this thing, your schedule over to this thing it says you shall not go after. <laughs> you shall not go after other gods. And then <laughs> then it says that. Uh, of the gods of the people around about you. So don't go after other gods by self-will, but don't go after other gods by being influenced by others, bad company. So don't choose their gods. When you see people living a certain lifestyle, don't choose to adapt to that lifestyle yourself. Now, verse 15 is very powerful. Verse 15 says, the Lord your God is a jealous God among you, lest he Lest the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and you be destroyed from off the face of the earth. Verse 15 of Deuteronomy 6 is very powerful because the text is telling you something mighty here. Is letting you know to not let yourself, do not let yourself provoke the jealousy of God. How could you do that? that you start giving your time, your obedience, your servanthood to other things, to other avenues, to things that God has not scheduled for your life. Don't let yourself become a servant to things that grieve the Holy Ghost. That's what the Bible is saying here. He's a jealous God. That means that when he invests in you, he expects the best from you. He expects you to give him your all. He expects your undivided, undivided attention. He expects your life. He expects your money. He expects your body. He expects your mind. He expects all of your being to be engrafted into the spirit leading it and ruling it. He expects all of you to be governed by him. He don't expect you to backslide. He don't expect you to sin against him. He don't expect you to disrespect him. He don't expect you to join in with people that are enemies of God. He wants you to be loyal to him like he is loyal to you. In Deuteronomy chapter six, verse 15 is very powerful because it reveals that God is jealous. So once he set you free and he pick you, don't have no disrespect towards him. Whatever he says to you goes. Don't be up there resisting God. You ain't got no say so because God, he has given you the best of the best. And now he wants the best of the best from you. He's a jealous God. Don't shortchange him. While you go back into sin, now you're arousing his jealousy. When you choose to be trifling, you're arousing his jealousy. When you connect with God's enemies, you're arousing his jealousy. When you choose to divert from the schedule of God, you're arousing his jealousy. When you are unthankful, you arouse his jealousy. When you are unfaithful, you arouse his jealousy. When you are blind, when you have your eyes open and you go right back to deception, you are arousing his jealousy. When he set you free from a path, and you consider that path, you are arousing his jealousy. When you have money given to you by God and you don't sow no money into his work, you don't sow no money into your prophet, you don't sow no money into your pastor, your teacher of the word, you are arousing his jealousy. So the Bible says that the Lord is a jealous God. It says, lest his anger be kindled against you, and you'll be destroyed off of the face of the earth. In verse 16, it says, do not tempt the Lord your God as you did in Massa. Massa was a place where they tempted God. They disrespected him. They disrespected God's prophet. They disrespected God's instruction. And they didn't follow through with their deliverance. They got set free by the prophet. They got set free by the man of God and they wanted to go back to Satan's life. They wanted to go back to Satan's will and God said that he was tempted by them. They provoked him to wrath in verse 16. Verse 15 says that he's a just God and verse 16 says, do not tempt the Lord your God as they tempted him in Massa. And verse 17 says, uh, and you shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord. 
That means that you have to pursue what he has commanded you, whatever he has trained you to do. Keep it in front of you. Don't forget it. Keep it in front of you. Don't forget it. It says that you shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord. Keep his commandments diligently. Keep his commandments diligently. You shall keep the commandments of the Lord diligently. You shall diligently keep his commandments. In verse 17, Deuteronomy 6, it says, keep his testimonies, keep his statures as he has commanded thee. Keep all those things going. And saints, if you choose to walk like that, you'll be a rich person. God will not only make you rich in your soul, full of the word, full of wisdom, but he'll make you rich in your finances because you keep him first. Live a life of sowing, live a life of honor, live a life of obeying God financially. Keep him number one in your finances. Give him first place in everything. Everything that you have, Proverbs chapter three, verse nine says, that you honor the Lord with your substance, with your money, with all the first fruit of your increase. Every time you increase, every time you get money, you should think about honoring God. You should think about sowing because that's how you fear him. That's how you honor him is that you keep him number one with everything he gives you. When he ministers seed to you, like 2 Corinthians 9 says, he's going to minister seed to the sower. That means he's going to put money in your hands for you to sow into the gospel. He's going to put money into your hands for you to help out the preacher of the word, for you to bless your prophet. That's how God works. And when you operate in the kingdom system of sowing, you also receive reaping. And the harvest is always bigger than what you gave because God is your exceedingly great reward. Bless everybody for watching this broadcast. Thank you for sharing this broadcast. Be blessed in Jesus' mighty name. Ask the Lord, forgive you of your sins. I repent. Say, Jesus, possess me. I want to know you. I want your wisdom. Give me your wisdom. In Jesus' name. Those of you all that saw into this ministry, thank you so much for sowing into me. Love you in the name of Jesus. Bless you. Of course, we only got three ways to give. So do not be scammed in your inbox by anybody. All the details are on my page. We got three ways to give. All the details are on my page. I bless all of you sowers in my ministry. I bless all of my prophetic partners all across the world. Thank you for sowing into me. Thank you for helping me preach the word. And I look forward to seeing you at my next conference. I would love to meet you and spend time with you in the conference and release the power of God to you. And those of you all that are, are in regions right now where there's chaos going on, remember, this is your time to really seek God and go after his hedge, his protection, his instruction. Sometimes God uses calamity in a place so that you would have a demand on your spirit to come forth. You got to listen to instructions now. You got to seek God. And so there's a lot of things that the Father uses to get you into prayer and focus and watchfulness and sanctification and living holy, living holy. Which What, what does living holy mean? Living a Holy Spirit-led life. So bless all of you all in the name of Jesus. And thank you so much for watching the broadcast. Thank you for sharing the broadcast. Spirit, calm down. And manifest your power. Oh Lord, calm down. And manifest your power. Holy Spirit, calm down. And manifest your power. Oh Lord, calm down. And manifest your power. Holy Spirit, calm down and manifest your power. Oh Lord, calm down and manifest your power. Mark the perfect man 
The end of that man is peace. Is peace. Mark the perfect man. The end of that man is peace. Mark the perfect man. The end of that man is peace. Is peace. Mark the perfect man. The end of that man is peace. Mark the perfect man. The end of that man is peace. Mark the perfect man. The end of that man is peace. Mark the perfect man. The end of that man is peace. You are so beautiful to me. Lord, you are so beautiful to me. Can't you see your everything I hope for? Everything that I need, you are so beautiful. Oh, oh, oh. You are so beautiful. King Jesus is so beautiful to me.